Once you create something and put it out there, there's no telling what the rest of the world will make of it or even what they'll use it for. Sometimes people get it exactly right, but sometimes the things we create take a life of their own and people forget where they actually came from. Today, we're going to look back and take a look at some of the things we use every day, find out if we're staying true to what they were originally designed for or if things have gone totally off course. From birthday parties to dad groups to a maybe questionable activity for a first date, bowling has been a part of our lives for generations. But when you look at it, it's pretty hard to imagine if being anything other than a fun game and a way to pass the time. The first bowling set can be traced back to ancient Egypt. Archaeologists found a set of pins and a round ball in the tomb of a young boy. But after that, bowling seems to disappear from the history books until it reappeared across the continent in Germany, of all places. What today is an excuse to eat some greasy food and maybe have a few beers or two was a way for people in 3rd century Germany to cleanse their sins. When bowling came rolling back into our lives for the second and last time, it had turned into a symbolic ritual to rid people and the community of their terrible sins. Games would be organized by local churches, and churchgoers would line up outside to get their turn at rolling a stone at a set of stone pillars or pins. The pins symbolized a sin, and a churchgoer who managed to knock down all of the pins would have symbolically defeated all of their sins. They then leave happy and cleansed and ready to do it all again the following week. I'm sure dads all over the world will be using this one as an excuse the next time they want to go out bowling with their friends. Germany has been the birthplace of many inventions and creations throughout history, but it has another game beside bowling to add to that long list, and I'm sure you know which one it is already. Chinese checkers. Yes, don't let the name fool you, or do I mean that was the point? In 1892, the German game company Ravensburg created a new board game based off of an older American board game called Halma. With the new shape of a star and simplified gameplay, this new board game took off and became a huge success. But Ravensburg hit a massive snag when they tried to take their new game back to America. In 1928, people in America were fresh out of World War I and they didn't exactly have fond feelings towards the Germans. Knowing that this was going to be a huge problem with their marketing campaign but not wanting to miss out on the huge American market, management at Ravensburg had to take a step back and put their thinking caps on. Nobody in America wanted to buy anything from a German company, but they did like one thing, Mahjong. In 1928, Mahjong was the height of popularity with American citizens, and that gave the people of Ravensburg an idea. With one quick switch of their board game's name, Ravensburg flooded the American market with their new and innovative board game, Chinese Checkers. No one would ever suspect that a game named Chinese Checkers had actually come from Germany, and they didn't. People today still don't know the truth, and that's what I'd call a successful marketing campaign. I know what you're thinking. If anyone anywhere was ever going to invent the vending machine, it would be the home of vending machines, Japan. That's why so many of you are about to get totally confused when you find out that vending machines got their start all the way back in ancient Greece. Yes, that's right. And while you're trying to piece that all together, throw in the reason why the Greeks needed them too. Holy water, yes. The priests and priestesses at temples in ancient Greece had a big problem, and that was with worshippers coming in and taking more holy water than they were supposed to. The priests simply couldn't keep up with the demand and ended up having to either bless multiple vats of water a day or run out before the day was done and send worshippers home parched. That was until one man, a hero if you will, decided to fix the problem. Hero of Alexandria. In 215 BC, Hero, a mathematician and an engineer, walked into the temple grounds with a solution to end all other solutions. It was simple. He put the holy water behind a wall with a slot just about big enough for a coin to fit through it. Already there, the concept sounds familiar, but these worshippers weren't about to buy a snack or a soda or a used pair of underwear if you're watching in Japan. Worshippers wanting to get some holy water would push their coin through the slot where it would fall onto a plate on the other side. The coin would be heavy enough to tilt the plate, which would then push the lever on the tap open, 
and start the holy water flowing. The tilt would also cause the coin to eventually slide off the plate, which would then close the lever. And Eureka! Barcodes. What are they? Why do we need them? And how do they make the cash register go beep and make me owe money? It all goes back to a man named N. Joseph Woodland, a former Boy Scout who was all about efficiency. He wanted to come up with a quick way to visually transfer data so he could stay on top of tracking inventory. Then it hit him. Back in his Boy Scout days, Woodland had learnt Morse code. He knew that what he wanted to do now was to figure out a way to transfer entire sentences using only a dot and dash, but just not with sounds. He asked himself what would happen if he used thick and thin lines instead of dots and dashes, and then he had it. The barcode. Suddenly, he had a way to transfer information, keep stock and track inventory, all at the scan of a laser. Chapter 8. Caution Contents May Be Hot We've all seen them. The warnings on the side of our paper coffee cups that warn us that the drink inside is hot. It's silly. We know it is. We just ordered our drink. We probably even saw it being made. So why are companies still so worried about covering their backs? Well, Stella Liebeck had something to do with that. In 1992, she was 79 years old and had just bought a coffee from McDonald's when her life was flipped upside down. She was in the passenger seat of the car and asked her grandson to pull over so that she could put cream in her coffee. Off came the lid and out came the coffee as well, all over Stella's lap. We've all been there. We're all probably wincing when we think about it, but poor Stella had more than sore skin and an awkward ride home ahead of her. Just from accidentally spilling her coffee into her lap, Stella got third-degree burns. She ended up in the hospital getting skin grafts to her thighs and her groin, and more than understandably, Stella was a bit upset. She felt like the McDonald's she'd bought the coffee from should cover her medical bills, seeing as the coffee they'd served her had been too hot. Stella asked for 20,000 US dollars. McDonald's offered her 800. Stella took them to court, and her legal team discovered that McDonald's were actually serving their hot drinks at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, when 150 degrees would be enough to cause someone to experience third-degree burns if their skin came into contact with their coffee for more than two seconds. Stella walked into the courtroom asking to have her medical bills covered, and she left with $2.9 million in compensation. This was later reduced to $640,000, but it was enough for coffee sellers everywhere to become more than a bit cautious. Chapter 7. Fillings You wouldn't be mistaken for thinking that there was only one solution available to people suffering from cavities in the past. Without access to modern technology, it's not too far off a stretch to think that the only thing people would want to happen to their bad teeth would be to just pull them out. But our ancestors were smarter than the credit we give them. The oldest filling can be dated back all the way to a whopping 10,000 years ago. To put that into perspective, that's like someone from the movie Ice Age being able to go to the dentist while their child was being carried around by a woolly mammoth. They may not have been using the exact ingredients that we have available to us today, but our ancestors were using things like beeswax to fill holes in their teeth instead of pulling them out, and who can blame them? Chapter 5. CPR Dolls Have you ever thought about how many other people have used that CPR doll before you? You probably shouldn't, but not that you are. Let's talk about the most kissed woman in history, shall we? If you're from the UK, chances are you learnt to perform CPR while using a particular doll, and you might even remember her face. Ever thought she looked a bit lifelike? Maybe a bit too real? That's because she is. Well, was. Most CPR dolls in the UK have the same face, a face that was based off of the death mask of a real woman. The unnamed and unknown woman was found floating in the River Seine in the 1800s. When teaching the life-saving technique of CPR became more widespread, her face was used as a homage to her and the others who lost their lives to drowning. Chapter 6. Charcuterie Boards We all know that no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, but have you ever stopped up to ask yourself why they have a reputation for popping up out of nowhere? 
Well, one of the reasons behind it was the traps they set up to catch the people they were searching for. The Spanish Inquisition often operated in plain sight, and what better way to check if a whole bunch of people are what they say they are than by having a party? Members of the Inquisition would invite friends, family and people in the neighborhood over for a glass of wine and a snack. Then, the members would see if someone they knew was hiding something. They knew that people of different faiths didn't eat pork, and they also knew that that would be a good way of figuring out if people were actually practicing Christians or only pretending to be, so the Inquisition wouldn't pick them up and lock them in a dungeon. But everyone else also knew that too. And if a civilian walked into a party to find a huge pork roast on the table, everyone would know it was a trap. So the Inquisition got creative, and they put together a dish that we're all still eating today, the charcuterie board. By having different kinds of meats and cheeses on the plate, the charcuterie board looked like the perfect platter for a party while hiding its real purpose, to give the Spanish Inquisition members an opportunity to see which one of their neighbors would eat the pork. The charcuterie board was such a huge success with the Spanish elites that it became its own thing, and when the Inquisition died out, the board stayed. Chapter 9. Barber Pole Think of a barber pole. What color is it? Red and blue? Did you ever stop to ask yourself why? Well, it's so that back in the day, you'd know that your local barber could give you a good old bloodletting when you needed one. Somehow, somewhere, our ancestors picked up the idea that there was no better pick-me-up than having a little puncture and letting some blood out. The only problem was that in medieval times, doctors were hard to come by, and when they were in town, they were usually busy looking after the people who could afford to pay them the most. So, where did that leave the common folk to go to when they needed some medical attention? Well, the common folk weren't so worried about it until the Black Death swept through Europe and suddenly everyone wanted to make sure that they were in tip-top shape. With people less interested in getting their hair cut than they were actually staying alive, barbers throughout Europe started adding new services to their establishments, and they needed to advertise it too. They added the red stripe to their barber poles, red for blood, bloodletting to be exact, and that was that. Chapter 10. The Norwegian Resistance Most of us have heard of the French Resistance during World War II, but they weren't the only country that was occupied during the war and they weren't the only ones that were trying to kick the Germans out. The Germans were an unwelcome houseguest to many of their neighboring countries during World War II, and the same could be said when they crossed the sea and landed in Norway too. Norway, like many other countries around them, couldn't stand up to the German army, but that didn't mean that they were just going to roll over and welcome them either. But how could a country organize any kind of resistance to an occupation when they're literally being watched? It all started at Oslo University. Students began wearing paper clips on their lapels in a form of silent protest. And pretty soon, almost everyone in the country was doing it too. The Germans didn't notice at first, and when they did, the Norwegians could shake their heads and say, What, this old thing? I'm just honoring Johan Valle. Johan Valle was the Norwegian inventor who invented the paperclip. By the 1940s, paperclips were cheap, readily available, and literally bound the Norwegian people together. To this day, the Norwegians still celebrate the unity they showed when their country was occupied with national monuments in the shape of a paperclip, and the saying, hold us amen, or we are bound together. So we may not be rolling away our sins or hiding from the Spanish Inquisition anymore, but everything we've talked about here today has had an impact on our lives. Maybe next time you're in the office, you'll suddenly feel like you're a part of a resistance movement. Maybe something we'll do will go on to influence generations to come, and no one will have seen it coming. Who knows? All we know for sure is the only thing we can do is stay curious and ask ourselves why things are the way they are. Who knows the answers may surprise you. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any weirdly interesting content.